GMI Hub is accepting new songs for their 2023 Christmas compilation. To find out how to submit your song, go to www.gmihub.ca today. GMI Hub, Family Christmas, Volume 4. Now is the time to submit your original Christmas song. The Who Is You. If you're a songwriter and would love to be a part of our Christmas compilation project, then you're in the right place. Where can you submit? GMIHub.ca is the place. Please visit our website at GMIHub.ca and click on Family Christmas to find out how you can submit your song today. You could be a part of the GMI Hub Family Christmas Volume 4. Welcome back to GMI Hub Online. I'm so glad that you're here with us. Today is going to be an awesome day. It's, the, it's April, in April 2023 at the time of this recording, and it is Jazz Month, and we are so thrilled to be doing an episode on jazz today. But before I introduce our co-hosts and our special panelists, I'd like to remind you that you're watching GMI Hub, and if you are here for the first time, please like and subscribe right here on YouTube if you're here on YouTube, or like it here on Facebook if you're watching us on Facebook. Um, and know that we're available not only on Facebook, but we're here on Instagram, we're on TikTok, at GMI Hub. We're also on, on it, uh, Twitter, that's the one, Twitter, <laughs> at Industry Gospel. So we hope that you will follow us there. But one of the things we want you to do is when you go to our website at gmihub.ca, that is where you're going to find out a lot about what we are doing to help grow the gospel music industry. And some of the things that we're working on, one of the things that you probably saw at the beginning here is a compilation project where we would love to receive some submissions of Christmas music, original Christmas music that has not previously been uh, produced or, or even published. And we would love, love, love to receive those and put them together in a package so that we can help share that music to radio stations and other entities that would just love to play that music during the Christmas season. So please, please, please go to gmihub.ca and you'll get more information about that. Also, there's opportunity to sign up just to be part of the community because we want to connect with you and we'd love for you to connect with us. We want to celebrate with you anytime that you are releasing a song, anytime you're doing an event, we want to celebrate that with you. And so please, please, please consider joining us and, and, and supporting the endeavors. We're trying to build the infrastructure of the gospel music scene, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. So as you can tell, I just did, oh, an artist showcase. Yes, an artist showcase is coming May the 29th. We need you to be there. And oh my gosh, look at the lineup we have. We have Luke Langman, we have you, Missy, we have Tom Rowe, we have uh, Adrian Prince, and we have Jason Dunn that are going to be coming here. These are big names. Um, Jason Dunn, if I work backwards, Jason Dunn was, if you remember Hawk Nelson, he was the lead singer for Hawk Nelson. Now he's gone, Don Solo. I think he created a whole new band called the Dun Dunners, and we'd love to see him. Adrian Prince is a rap artist from Toronto. 
Tom Rowe, he is a country gospel artist, and we are so thrilled that he'll be able to come and see us. Yamissi is African, Caribbean um, uh, gospel artist. We'd love to hear that. And Luke Langman is an adult contemporary uh, artist. You've probably heard some of his songs on the radio, and we're so thrilled that they're all going to be here May 29th, so we want you to be there with us to enjoy it. It'll be in Mississauga Live at uh, 3434 Cawthor Road, which is the home of Mississauga Gospel uh, I think I said that name wrong, <laughs> Mississauga City uh, Baptist Church. And uh, we are so happy with their sponsorship for their support with us. So thank you so much. Now, all that commercial to say, you notice I did all that commercial. Normally, I have my buddy Dale doing that commercial. But unfortunately, my buddy's very, very sick right now. So, buddy, we are thinking about you. We're praying for you, hoping that you feel better soon. And uh, maybe you'll be back, not next week, but in two weeks, uh, where we'll be back together. But I am thrilled to have uh, a special co-host with us, is a member of our team, and she herself is in the jazz scene, um, award-winning recording artist and songwriter, Faith Amore. Faith is here. She is a Toronto vocalist steadily emerging into the North American jazz scene. She melds jazz and story, folk, music, and heart songs with the vibrant rhythms of the world, revealing her heart for exploration and connection. As she blends her remarkably warm yet pure vocals with lush harmonic landscapes, she creates an alluring modern jazz world sound, um, reflecting the influences of her multicultural city extensive music study, world travel, and the South American heritage. Over the last decade, face vocal finesse, musicianship, and charismatic presence have amassed, amassed with musical friends and fans of, of, uh, of her across North America and Europe. Faith, I'm so glad you're able to join us. <laughs> Say hello to everybody. Thank you. Hello to everybody. <laughs> Hi, it's so great to be here. It's so great to be co-hosting with you, Cheryl. You do such a great job week after week. And I will uh, humbly sit in this spot for Dale. Hope that you feel better really soon, friend. Yeah, great to be here. Uh, it's great to have you. Now, Faith, you're not really a stranger here. I mean, we've had you on here nope. before as a guest, but it's been, so, I don't know, uh, it's been over a year ago, two years ago, maybe. We had you here as a was, guest too is mid p word um yeah um yeah, yeah. Talking about music business so yeah that's right that's that's right that's right so we're so glad to have you back and if joy if you're watching hi we got to get you back on here too <laughs> Yeah, it's so, great though, because tonight we get to be with some other of my friends in the jazz music industry. So this is very exciting. It is very exciting. Hey, Faith, got to ask you a question though. It sure. is Jazz Music Week. So I want to know, tell me, tell me, tell me what this means for you as a jazz artist, Jazz Music Week. So um, a number of years ago, April was, was announced as International Jazz Month and specifically April 30th as International Jazz Day, um, where some incredible things happen, performances um, in all sorts of venues all over the world, and one grand live streamed performance by some of the superstars of jazz. And so the entire month is, uh, is an opportunity to kind of delve into the history of the genre, uh, to explore um, the music and to make a lot of music. So there are lots of events that happen that are um, also honoring jazz. And so it's more chances to play, um, more excuses to, you know, swing and snap your fingers on the two and four. It's just a great celebration all month. So I love it. I love it every year. Awesome. Awesome. So does that mean you're going to be busy now all month? I'm, I'm glad I got you tonight. <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of in semi-retirement, um, but we weren't going to talk what? about that today. Um, basically, okay. um, I not this year. This year, it will be very virtual. I will be connecting with people, um, sharing songs that I love and brand new jazz tunes on my social media. Um, in terms of live performances, I'm holding back because I have some other things that I've prioritized for this season of my life. Um, but again, it's not about me at all. Um, but, but yeah, it, ultimately <laughs> April is a really great month for jazz musicians who want to 
play. Well, I guess if any, if there's any jazz opportunities, any uh, any events out there, go ahead and enjoy them. And while we're talking about it, Faith, let's introduce uh, some of your friends. So let's do. Let's start with Jesse Ryan. Go Jesse. ahead with his bio if he's got that there. I do. He's the gentleman. Uh, if you're just listening, in a lovely orange toned hat and top. Um, that's, that's, I'm stalling. You, you good? You got it, Cheryl? I got it. Here he is. Okay. <laughs> Jesse Ryan is Trinidadian born and he's a saxophonist and composer with a keen interest in the connections between jazz and Afro-Caribbean classical, uh, sorry, musical traditions and communicating translucent ideas through his music. He's June, his Juno nominated debut album called Bridges is an oral exposition, exposition of a stellar musicianship that incorporates his explorations of his own cultural roots and expertise in the modern jazz idiom. And according to Medium Magazine 2021, he is the 2020 recipient of the Toronto Arts Foundation's Emerging Arts, a Jazz Artist Award. And as a sideman, he, he has performed and recorded with number of different artists including Lorna Lewis and Joy Lass Lewis who have been here on our show serves as a board of, on the board of directors for the Toronto Arts Foundation let's welcome Jesse Ryan Jesse so glad you're here oh you need to unmute your you're mic. muted dear friend yeah <laughs> hey, hey can you hear me Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Amazing. Good. So glad <laughs> to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. We're so glad you're here. We're looking forward to this conversation with you. Yeah, me okay. too. Okay. And, <laughs> <laughs> and next down the line, we have double bassist composer and arranger Duncan Hopkins all the way from Oshawa, Ontario. He has been working at the highest levels of jazz for almost 30 years. And in that time, he has worked with lots of uh, luminaries such as Norma Winston, Rob McConnell, Scott Hamilton, Houston Pierce, Peter Appleyard, and D Diana Krall, and many, many more. Duncan is a member of the Rob McConnell and uh, the Boss Brass and is highly distinguished Canadian Jazz Quartet for 10 years before moving to Europe. Welcome, Duncan. So glad you're here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's an honor. It's an honor to have you. And last but not okay. least, do you want to introduce this one? I do. I really do. This okay. is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Shepherd. I'm going to use my velvety voice because it says this velvety voice of pianist Elizabeth Shepherd arrived on the international scene in 2006 when her debut album, Start to Move, was voted one of the top jazz albums of the year by listeners of the actually don't know how to say this, Giles Peterson show on BBC Radio Worldwide. Um, since Gillis, <laughs> God, I try, Gillis Peterson show. Since then, the Montreal-based soul jazz innovator has established herself as one of the most alluring and imaginative artists on the scene today. Started with classical piano, she loved old school hip hop. She has been called a jazz virtuoso, blessed with a pop sensibility by the Globe and Mail, and praised worldwide as she's performed alongside Esperanza Spalding and Robert Glasper. Um, uh, and in terms of her being part of that new wave of artists, um, just bringing a new flavor to what it is that we call jazz. A six time Juno nominee and a two-time Polaris Prize nominee. Very, very big deals. Um, she's collaborated with uh, Lionel Lueke and uh, traveled across the world performing and selling out crowds um, in Tokyo and London. Um, jazz festivals played alongside Christian McBride, Victor Wooten. It really, it's really a long and incredible career so far. Um, opened for Jamie Cullum at the Hollywood Bowl. It was a sold out show. Right now she has a new album, which she'll be talking about later on in the program, Three Things. And it's a result of her working over the last three years, 
during the thing that shall not be named, um, collaborating with different artists um, during restrictions and stay at home orders. This is Elizabeth Shepard. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Faith. So nice to be here. Excellent. Excellent. Over well, to you, Cheryl. It's, it's awesome having all of you here. And um, as a person that I, I'm kind of the, which one of these are not like the other? I'm the only one that's not here <laughs> in the jazz scene, but I would love to know your story. What is your story? How did you get into the jazz scene? Let's start with Jesse. Okay. Uh, yeah. I grew up in Toronto and Tobago and um, I'll kind of give you a quick story. So when I was around 10 years old, my aunt bought me a little Walkman. For those of you who knows what a Walkman is. Um, and, um, there was one channel that I, that I got and I just remembered sounding something like bluesy, some sort of Broadway ish sort of jazzy music on the station. And that was the first time I had ever heard anything like that. Um, cause in, in my immediate environment, you know, I grew up in church and I grew up around, um, Trinidadian folk music, steel pan and all that. So it was very different to my ear. And so I kind of fell in love with the sound of it. And when I later went to high school, um, my music teacher uh, introduced us, you know, to many different styles of, of music. And um, I remember the sound of jazz and, and just kind of gravi gravitated towards it. So that's kind of how I got into it. it. I didn't really start playing jazz really until I was around 19 years old, much later. Um, so that's kind of how I you know, came across jazz and, and got into it. That's, That's awesome. Cool. <laughs> Let's go over to Duncan Hopkins. Duncan, how did you get into jazz music? Uh, actually, it was somewhat similar to Jesse. Uh, I was, it was in high school and uh, I think I was singing with the jazz choir and uh, the bass player was notoriously uh, 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 absent. So my uh, music teacher said, well, you got big hands, you can play the bass. And I went, okay. <laughs> that's all so, it takes, uh, eh? That's all it takes these days. Yeah, apparently right. that's all it is. So my parents okay. bought me an electric bass and uh, and I, I, I had studied piano. So I knew a bit about harmony and reading and, uh, and, and I grew up in a very musical family as well. And my dad had one jazz album and uh, we had a lot of brass band. My dad was a trombone player. Uh, but he had a he had a brass band album that did uh, the St. Louis Blues, uh, like like Glenn Miller's band did, but it was with a brass band, and I would sit and play the drums with that all the time because uh, it was uh, a lot of fun. But he had one jazz album which was four trombones, which were, you know J.J. J. Johnson and uh, you know, the other guys. Uh, the, the, they had a band, and but the the rhythm section was uh, John Lewis and uh, and Charlie Mingus. And that kind of set me on a uh, kind of a search to find more music from those guys. So, and, and that's, uh, I think for me, it's been a uh, just a constant kind of search. You know, you like one artist and then you go and see, you know, Weather Report, you know, and, and I love Jocko and kind of fell in love with that. But then I wanted to find out, well, who's a piano player and who did he play with and, and sort of work my way back. So. That's uh, that's a journey I'm I'm still doing. I'm still doing it now. <laughs> that's awesome. There's so much music, so that journey is, is indefinite. Or yeah, amazing. Elizabeth, Let's... how did you get into jazz? Yeah, I was I was kind of late to the party. I um, I decided I wanted to study music uh, in university after high school. And growing up, uh, I grew up in the Salvation Army. Uh, my parents are ministers and so we had a lot of brass band music and a lot of church music and I did classical piano, but that was it. So there were these huge gaps of musical knowledge of which jazz was one of them. So I went off to university and uh, there were only two programs to study. There was like classical or jazz. And I quickly became a parent that I wasn't good enough for classical. I got into the program, but I was like, I'm not, I'm not like, honestly, I know I'm not concert pianist material. And uh, the thought of that was just terrifying anyways. And so um, I, you know, I was kind of restless and thinking like, what, what else could I do? And it would, you know, they were like, well, what about jazz? I'm like, 
I, I really don't know this music. Um, and uh, around the same time, my boyfriend at the time was a hip hop MC, and uh, he would, you know, play me all this stuff from the heyday of hip hop, which I would say is like the early '90s. And a lot of the stuff uh, that they're rapping to is um, it's like jazz, you know, samples that are produced and, and reworked. And I would listen to those samples, be like, what is that? Who is that? Herbie Hancock? Who's this guy? And started doing my research and going backwards. So I was kind of developing this natural interest in jazz. As I was at my first year of university going, I can't do classical, like I, my heart's not in it. So I, I switched to the jazz program and, um, you know, I remember being at the first lesson and they're like, okay, so uh, let's do some progressions. <laughs> this is like jazz technical lingo here. And I'm like, what's a, what's a progression? And they're like, you know, a two, five. I'm like, what's a two, five. I was a complete mm -hmm. novice. And so I, I had to learn a lot. Um, and, and the more I, I got into the music, the deeper I got, the more I, I found it just resonated on so many levels, uh, you know, like really deeply, um, with my ear and my heart and my soul. And, um, yeah, it's, it's something that, uh, I feel I've embarked on this musical path, but I really associate it too with, um, like a, a path in life, you know, that, um, I experience my own sort of spiritual growth, uh, through music. Um, yeah, that's, that's a lot. I'm like, I feel like I could go on, but I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Cliffhanger. It's good. It's good. Wow. You know, I, what I found interesting is that most of you started, well, at least uh, Jesse and Duncan, you started right as basically as young people getting into jazz music. And, you know, it made me go back in time. I remember in schools, there was a time when jazz was the, the music. There's the jazz bands, the senior band and the, the junior band all had to learn jazz music. At that time, I think it was, was there such a thing as classic jazz. I don't know if that's the right way to say that, but just there was a certain type of, of jazz style that was there. And now I'm I'm finding that jazz has actually evolved, so, which is, I, I want to get into that a little bit later, but um, uh, I'm kind of jumping here. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm curious about, about the next question, your answer to the next question, which I don't, I want to ask, but I'm going to let Faith ask it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'll ask it. The Did question is, if I mean, we could do it together, but okay. okay. If you had to define if, jazz as jazz. a style, what what would, would you, you say? say? I wouldn't want to define jazz. Actually, <laughs> 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 it's, it's too wide. It's too widespread. But uh, I guess if I had to. Uh, uh, try to somehow put a label on it, it would be uh, uh, some level of improvisation, I think. Yeah, I, I would love to add to that. I mean, I think it's really hard to define jazz, but there I think key elements are kind of uh, have remained at the core of what it is, even though it's evolved, you know. So as, as Duncan said, improvisation is one of them. Um, I think one of the the interesting things about how jazz developed is that at its core, it was trying to take influences from different parts of the world. Um, so there's definitely a European um, um, influence, um, but we know that it was it was born out of the African American experience. So I think it was just pulling from all different places, and I think the spirit of bridging things together and forming connection, musical connections, um, and using music music as a way to um, activism for, for for spiritual growth, to to, to preach, to, to, to share a message. I think all of those things are at the core of what jazz is. And even though the sound of jazz, the instrumentation of jazz has evolved, I think those core elements still remain, you know, part of what it is today. Yeah, um, I really like how you say bridge. Uh, we use that word bridge, Jesse. It, it resonates with um, how I, you know, feel what I feel jazz to be. Also, this dialogue, right? This place where people mm -hmm. can 
truly be themselves. Um, and somehow there's, there's this tension uh, of many people fully being themselves um, and dialoguing and simultaneously having that be contained and having it be having there be space for all of that. And I feel like that is a that's a small miracle because I don't think there are many places in our human existence where we can do that, right? Where we can really fully be ourselves and be completely different from the other people that we're sharing that yeah. moment with. Um, and, and yet, yet it's it, it that's what it's all about and dialoguing and finding a way way through any difference or, you know, um, uh, there's no such thing as, as like conflict within that space. It's, it's negotiating mm. all these different, yeah. um, presences. Yeah. That's I good. love to jump over that because, uh, one of the things that attracted me to jazz when I was growing up was the fact that, um, you could be an individual and you could have something personal to say. Um, which is very different to when I sat the music and I was studying like classical saxophone. And so when I was introduced mm. to jazz, that sort of freedom to be able to express myself was, was interesting to me. But then the idea of how um, the music is, is not, is the sum total of all the parts, all the musicians' contributions. So, you know, even though we think about jazz superstars and icons like Miles Davis and, and John Coltrane, but the music wouldn't be what it is without everybody's contributions. You know? So it's, mm. it's the sum of everybody adding their voice and their own individual statement. And like you said, negotiating what it should sound like and where the music should go that kind of creates what it is. It's almost yeah, the think... uh, improv is... Oh. No, go ahead. I was just going to say quickly uh, that it's, uh, I was watching something with Wayne Brady the other day and um, it's the idea of the improv concept of yes and. So we're not stomping on each other's toes. We're not trying to say, no, this is the way it's going to go. We are moving with the tide. We are um, playing off of each other um, to, find, to reach that, that end point together um, and creating beautiful moments along the way. So I love that. And ultimately, good music is always a bridge. Wouldn't you agree, uh, Jesse? Absolutely. <laughs> That's a good song title, by the way, um, Feet. Yes, and. Mm. <laughs> okay, I'll There's see that already. It's going to come out of this. <laughs> <laughs> Duncan, what were you about to say? I was just going to really uh, uh, agree with all those points and that uh, essentially music, but jazz in particular, is a, is a language and we're, we're communi uh, communicating. And, and, you know, maybe it's open to interpretation a little bit from the listener, but uh, we are communicating and it, it is a language. Uh, there's no question about it. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's yeah, really I, I think that's, that's probably the, uh, Go ahead, I was going to say, I think that's probably the best way to say it. Like it's, it's definitely a language. And um, just, I think, you know, if you were to ask some, you know, ask that question, you would get different answers based on the geographical location and generation, yep. right? That you're asking, mm -hmm. right? Um, experiences, for sure. But, mm -hmm. but across time and across geographical places, it's, it is a language. It's a melodic, harmonic, and rhythmic language, definitely. I love that. <laughs> I love that. And it's funny, there's no other genre or style of music that has been ever defined like that. So I love hearing this. This is so cool. Um, I'm going to, I, I just want to give a chance for a commercial break. But after that, um, I want to find out a little bit more about how jazz and the gospel works out of, uh, like, how that puts, how that's connected, how that comes together. So after this commercial break. GMI Hub is accepting new songs for their 2023 Christmas compilation. To find out how to submit your song, go to www.gmihub.ca today. GMI Hub Family Christmas Volume 4. Now is the time. 
to submit your original Christmas song. The Who Is You. If you're a songwriter and would love to be a part of our Christmas compilation project, then you're in the right place. Where can you submit? GMIHub.ca is the place. Please visit our website at GMIHub.ca and click on Family Christmas to find out how you can submit your song today. You could be a part of the GMI Hub Family Christmas Volume 4. We are back. We are back. Now, before that commercial break, we were talking about the definition of jazz. And I love what uh, Jesse Duncan and Elizabeth came up with. It's basically jazz, in a, in a sense, is like a building a bridge of different musical styles and personalities. And no one trumps over the other, but they all kind of gather each other's contribution and works with it and brings it all along. I know it's, I think that just, I love that definition. I think that's so awesome. And, and the last thing said was that jazz is in a sense, it's a language. It's a, I, I forgot how Jesse put it, but it's a rhythmic, uh, I missed the three words now. Oh gosh. Melodic, rhythmic, and there's a third word. Harmonic. <laughs> Harmonic that's the one. <laughs> language. I love hearing that. That is so awesome. So let's, I want to put all that, that package together and ask the question, how does the, the gospel fit into this? Do, do you take this language and basically communicate a gospel message through this, through your own lives or through your music? That's a tough question. <laughs> I mean, I, I think if I were to, to tackle that question, it would, it would kind of start with my, you know, my personal experience on my journey. Um, so I, I grew up in church. Um, my, you know, my parents were both like Sunday school teachers and um, grew up in, in church in the Pentecostal church in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, I grew up in a unique time in, in, in Trinidad where the world of anything, you know, African folk music um, or anything that was considered secular was kind of beginning to be accepted in the church, which wasn't necessarily the case before, um, like, the the 90s. So, um, you know, jazz music was considered secular. You know, I think there's a there's a... Uh, a, a really great story of Thomas Dorsey, the, the great um, American um, composer, pianist. Um, he he was a church musician, but then he spent time in the jazz clubs. And so when he came back to church, he was bringing all of those influences and they actually didn't like what he was doing. They called what he was doing secular. So I think there was always this push and pull, this talk between what's considered secular and what's considered sacred. And I experienced that as well. When I fell in love with jazz, it was, there was a bit of a push and pull on top between an okay. Is this jazz, or rather, is, is this okay to play this music? Um, and as I got older and, I, and I, I had some mentors kind of helped me navigate that, um, the gospel is really a message. Um, and so we can use any form of medium to, to share that message. Um, whether overtly, like the gospel style of music, or um, more intrinsically put into the music where um, sometimes it's an inspirational message. Um, and so for me, you know, when you read my bio, I, I'm really focused on finding the connection between jazz and Afro-Caribbean music styles, but really trying to share transcendent ideas and those transcendent ideas come from the gospel um, within my music. Interesting, yeah, yeah. Elizabeth and Duncan, any thoughts on this? Lots. Well, 
<laughs> it's they have tons. Uh, They're just like, how much should I say? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, clearly I'm a little bit older than everyone else. So uh, I know I, I can say that uh, my parents, much like uh, Elizabeth, my, my parents were uh, members of the Salvation Army, as, as I was. And uh, jazz was something that wasn't really in the house. And, and jazz was something that, that we didn't play. And, uh, and in fact, when I did start playing jazz, it was a, a problem uh, in my house. And, uh, and when I went to uh, play a little bit more regularly and started to sort of become a professional, uh, my mom never came into a club to see me play. She never would and died without ever seeing me. So um, my dad did uh, in the end, and it was hard for him to come into a club to come and see me play. And he, he thanked everybody uh, that I was working with for their help. And so um, it, it, it was actually quite difficult. And, and I think less so now. Uh, certainly, you know, just being a little bit older, I, I don't care as much. But... Uh, but I think uh, it, it was a real problem when I was a, a, a young musician. And uh, I did attempt to kind of bring my two worlds together uh, at a, a concert, and then I recorded a live album. In fact, that's where I met uh, Elizabeth, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, her parents were very kind to me and my wife when we first moved to town. And... Uh, uh, but those were sort of my two worlds, the Salvation Army and, and, uh, and I had young children who I was trying to bring up in the same way I was brought up. And, uh, but also I was playing jazz, you know, pretty much uh, every night. So uh, it, it's, it's been a bit of a struggle now, like I said, now not so much. But uh, in the early days, it was, uh, uh, it was looked, it was frowned upon. To be because uh, I was in clubs, you know, especially with the Salvation Army being a, a, a temperance society, uh, it, it was it was frowned upon for me to be uh, to be in a club. So it, it may still be. I don't know. <laughs> wow. wow, is that the same with you, Elizabeth? Is it the same feedback? Knowing that you're both well, from the Salvation I'm a bit... Army. Yeah, I mean, I'm a bit younger than Duncan. I also came to it later. So there's probably 15 years, I'm going to say, between when you were starting in jazz and when I was. Um, yeah, maybe. So I, that wasn't really my experience. Uh, my parents, uh, they were living in France when I decided I wanted to, to study jazz. And I was in Montreal, so <laughs> they, they didn't have much say over that, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> But my spiritual home was, as I mentioned before, in the Salvation Army, and the Salvation Army is, you know, it's a it's a congregation, evangelical congregation, but it also has a huge social services component. And it was clear in my household that uh, music was, you know, it sort of went like God, the Salvation Army and music in like very quick <laughs> succession there. Mm. Um, and um, so music was really valued. Uh, but specifically to, for the service and glory of God. Um, and I, um, I, I, you know, it took me a while to, to, to find my own way. And I, like, I took some, some space from the church to figure out what was inherited and what was mine. And, uh, and I feel like music was the one thing that stayed with me as this avenue of faith throughout all of that. Um, and I think part of the reason why I love jazz so much is that it is a deeply spiritual music in, you know, we talked about the improvisational aspect and to improvise, you have to, you have to really get out of your own head and be a channel. Uh, at least that's how I, I feel, you know? Um, and so the, the deeper I got into jazz, the more I realized that I was bringing all these elements from my, my spiritual home, you know, the sort of the social justice aspect of the Salvation Army. And so I felt like, you know, there's that in jazz and it became part of my music and the raison d'etre for the music that I, I was making. Um, there's also the, 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 the spiritual exploration uh, of, of improvising and uh, that, that point at which you feel like you're really truly connecting with God um, and also connecting with other people um, I feel like connection is is um, 
you know, it's, that's a spiritual matter right there. So kind of like what Jesse said, that it's, it's not so much an explicit gospel message, but these truths that are apparent in, in the Bible and, and, um, explained time and again in different ways that I feel, um, inform, um, gospel music and jazz. I don't see them as, as totally different. Right. Is there a connection there with your current um, album, Three Things, it's entitled? Yeah. Yeah, Three Things. It's uh, Three Things Remain, Faith, Hope, and Love. But of the three, uh, the greatest is love. And you have two of those in it's your name, Faith, faith oh, and sorry. Love. Right. <laughs> yeah. I do. I do. My mom was thinking ahead. She's like, yeah. Yeah. Middle name. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, my experience, <laughs> um, no, I usually <clears throat> tell people it's charity. Um, but yeah, my experience was very much like Duncan's, um, where like there are certain places, like my, my mother is my, my biggest fan and, um, she, there are certain places she really just doesn't, didn't want to, um, come hear me play. Um, and so that's always something that's a consideration from a, you know, conservative Christian background. Um, and just that, that struggle of, well, does my music have to say, um, an explicit gospel message for it to be, um, glorifying God, or should I even be in these places or should I be a light everywhere I go, regardless of who's there? So those are definitely questions that I struggled with, um, in the early days. And yeah, yeah. So I, I completely understand what you're, what you're talking about there. Cheryl, you were I saying. Find, I was going to say, I find that so interesting. Like, now, I, uh, for two reasons. One, um, on the one side, I, I know I used to hear about this back in the 80s, not about jazz music, but about certain bands, like rock bands and all that, facing mm -hmm. that same kind of rejection. They're playing their style of music. And, and uh, maybe what's a little different is, they were explicitly sharing the gospel through that music, but because it was through that music, they were still being rejected by the church and therefore ended up really on their own, which made me kind of sad to hear that. And now when I, and then the other side of this is, um, I think of jazz and the first song that comes to my mind is when the saints go marching in. And <laughs> when I, when I hear that, when I have that song in my head, I immediately have, what I perceive to be a jazz composition in this. Like I, I hear the, the horns going, I hear the, 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 the drums going, I hear everything going on similar to what I would hear in a jazz setup, a, a jazz tune. And when the saints go marching into me is a, a typical Christian song, just typical to me anyway, or a gospel song. And, and it's, I, 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 uh, maybe I'm making the wrong assumption, but I thought it was accepted worldwide. So I'm, I'll be honest, I'm a little surprised that that mm -hmm. jazz is not accepted in the church. I really am surprised <laughs> by that, honestly, because because I go, I hear that all the time. I remember singing that song on the subway, you know, kind of idea, you know, it's just, I just thought it was all like, it's all part and parcel, but I, this is a, a surprise. Um, do you I have find two little points for that? Oh, sorry. Where's it? There's a question right there. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, oh, that's okay. Like I, I, I was just. Do you find it's well? Actually, I want to hear what you're going to say because maybe that would answer sure. my question already. Perhaps. Um, yeah. I am a gospel mind reader. Um, so the two little <laughs> things I was going to say. Thank you. Um, or when the certain song is going to pass. So like when the saints go marching in, we consider that just like New Orleans staple. Um, so that's a song that no one's really thinking about a gospel message there. They're just thinking this is a vibe and it's a good time and it's jazz. Um, and so there are a few other songs that kind of, um, have that kind of treatment. Um, but also there are, I guess, different opportunities where jazz does make its way into, I guess, the church. Um, like I'm a, I'm essentially on a jazz Vesper circuit. So there are certain churches that have expressly jazz services um maybe in the afternoon on a sunday or on a saturday um that are specifically a jazz group comes in and performs music that may or may not have a gospel message um so i've seen that um in terms of 
crossover. Anyone else either agree or have a note on that? Yeah, I mean, I was when 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 Cheryl mentioned um, when the Saints. I mean, it's an it's an obvious choice, um, yeah. and it's still very much you know part of the second line repertoire in in New Orleans. They still use it, you know, at funeral processions and all that in in New Orleans. Um, and I think New Orleans is a really good example to start exploring this idea of how jazz and gospel intersects. Um, but it also leads to some a little bit of dark history as well um, when, when, when we started to think about it. So, um, yeah, so, you know, when, Cheryl, when you mentioned, you know, you're surprised that, you know, there's, there's, um, there's a disconnect between jazz, how jazz is accepted, you know, and it's, it's really considered secular. And I think, um, you know, when, when Duncan and um, Elizabeth was, was sharing, I, I, I could, con I definitely connected with what they were saying, but for different reasons. Um, and it's interesting because in the Caribbean, um, one of the reasons why jazz was is, was kind of well anything um, that was coming from the African diaspora was really you know labeled as secular um, and really didn't have a place in the in the church um, and so um, you know the story is that there was a period of time in in the Caribbean specifically you know places like Jamaica Trinidad and so on where drumming was banned um and it's because the, the the slaves at the time used to use the drums to communicate and they used to use it to um to have their their ceremonies and just as a place to um you know have their own cultural ex expression and so that was definitely discouraged and I think so. There, there's definitely a seed of that that kind of continued, um, that made anything that was coming from that sort of that what do you call it that tributary of music and culture considered se secular, you know. Um, and it's so interesting that New Orleans is the place that um, where it intersects and it still is alive today because I've heard that historically. Uh, the English colonialists were actually a lot harsher than the French colonialists. And so the French colonialists d actually would allow the slaves to gather and, and create music. That's why you actually had the music thriving in New Orleans, because in, in, in the French quarters and so on. So I think there's a, it, it definitely, that question really brings up some of that history um, for me. And there are definitely echoes of it, you know, still to this day, as, and, you know, in our time, you know, feel as you say, your, your mom wouldn't come with certain shoes and and so on. It's it's still very much prevalent, you know, that that idea of clear lines of sacred and 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 secular. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I, I think in addition. Uh, sorry, I, I think in addition. Go ahead, the, go ahead Duncan. I, I I think the problem for uh, a lot of people of maybe the generation or two before me. Uh, uh, certainly within the church, within the Salvation Army in particular, was the lifestyle choices of a lot of people in in uh, uh, in jazz music, uh, and and the and the people who had families and lived quietly and did what they did that, that didn't get publicized. The things that were publicized were the guys who were uh, who were hooked on drugs, who were you know getting shot in a in the door of a club who were yeah i mean there's many many stories of of all these guys but you don't hear the stories of the guys who lived quiet lives performing music because you know it doesn't sell so uh i think for for my parents in particular i can only really speak about that is that that's what they saw when if you were a jazz musician you were you were strung out and 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 it was a lifestyle thing that they didn't want me to be a part of and, and it was just really trying to uh trying to protect me uh but for me it was never about that it was it was always about the music so um uh but you know that again that that's just my experience but uh uh 
I think that's what uh, what the problem was, and maybe maybe within the uh, in my early beginnings in the church that that was the problem, and and then it was it kind of paints a whole. Uh, uh, it, it's a broad stroke, I know, but it but it paints a whole genre of music with a with a really you know bad color. So. Oh wow. Do you think? that um, like just based on this uh, going forward, knowing that there's there's a variety of like today of the styles of music where you know the gospel music is being shared and jazz is one of them. A matter of fact, in the US they actually have gospel jazz. They literally have gospel jazz is mm -hmm. what they call it. And I don't know if you're, uh, uh, I, I, I think that basically is just gospel music or music with the gospel message being played in a jazz style literally is what I believe it is. Um, that being said, do you foresee that times are changing enough that that uh, I'll call it gospel jazz <laughs> could go forward? It could become more popular, um, you know. And um, and and I'll let you answer that question. And and because um, I had another comment that I thought was really cool too, but. Do you foresee that that changing? Do you foresee that as jazz evolves, that, that you can probably see the gospel message going forth through get, jazz music? I mean, that's that's a tough question because I think it really depends on how you define popular. Um, is so I'll say this way: when I was when I was growing up, the one of the albums that was really pivotal for me was uh, Kirk Williams. Um, gospel according to jazz series uh-huh um, i was wondering if he was going to come up mom, today excellent yeah absolutely um so my my mom i remember my mom went down to, to town to you know get some stuff and she came on really excited with this cd she's like i saw this cd and you know in a bookstore and i think you really like it and it really changed my life for a number of reasons because it was jazz and it was the gospel message and it was a representation of the ideal I was trying to pursue. How do I bring these two worlds that I exist in that don't necessarily overlap? And how do I bring them together? Um, but the 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 thing that really helped me to um, to move forward with that idea was when I looked into you know when I started to you know follow Cook Will um, and just hear him talk about his own faith journey. Um, I was encouraged that it is possible to be uh, a Christian, but in the mainstream, which is what he did. You know, he toured with with Whitney Houston, and you know, and did so many amazing things. He has his own, you know, professional career as a solo artist, um, and he he doesn't hide the fact that he's a Christian. You know, but he's on stages with you know with so many different people. So. Um, I'm saying I'm, I brought this up because he's a representation of, you know, gospel jazz probably at its you know its highest level in terms of that that iteration of what it is. But I think there's also a, a younger generation of musicians who grew up in the church or ad adjacent to the church, but who also played music. Um, musicians like Tim Green, musician like Raymond Fowler. Um, uh, I can't remember the pianist's name, but there's a there's a a, a whole generation of them in in the states across Corey the Henry. states. Corey Henry, right? Um, and I mean, it's hard to to think about um, to think about a musician, uh, singer, whether it be it in pop or jazz or blues, who didn't have some kind of church experience or influence, right? Um, so in terms of the popularity of the genre of gospel jazz. Um, I think it really depend on how much, you know, believers, Christians, people who want to, you know, who are in the circle and in the community want to, to support that and how an artist like ourselves, you know, to create that kind of music. I don't necessarily have a, a, a strong desire to necessarily brand what I do that way. Um, but, um, I think there's definitely, uh, a remnant, I was using the word remnant, of people who, you know, who create jazz, who who are really well known jazz musicians and they have a song or, or a song or two on their album that's like a 
or a gospel inspired or Christian song or or hymn or something. So I think it's 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 not just about more music within the jam, but also sort of looking for it in other places that we typically wouldn't necessarily find it. Right. I, I'm kind I, of going I, back in my head. Go ahead, uh, Elizabeth, go ahead. Yeah, I feel like um, sort of related to what you're saying, Jesse, I'm I'm noticing that I feel like I'm seeing more Christians come out, <laughs> so to speak, yeah. um, just becoming more overt about their faith. Um, not And Christians who are making music that is not labeled as gospel music. Uh, and I think as we've touched on before that there, you know, people, I think music can be God um, glorifying without being explicitly uh, gospel, you know, uh, in style or even in, in label. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I'm seeing people in different genres, uh, you know, different um, like singer songwriter or um, not just jazz, but who are sort of becoming more overt about their faith uh, as it just sort of a lived experience and therefore shared in the music that they're making. And I'm maybe I'm putting this forth as a bit of a question myself is um, do you know, I feel like that's kind of what I'm doing now. And as you said, Jesse, I'm not looking to like rebrand my music as like gospel jazz or jazz gospel or whatever the the like hook might be. Um, but just to to be authentic, you know, and, and have all these parts of myself somehow come together and in who I am uh, musically. Um, and so maybe because I feel like I'm doing that myself, I'm seeing it more around me, but I, I do wonder if there hasn't been some sense in which uh, we sort of have to hide the fact that we're Christian or this feeling that like you, you might not wanna publicize that. Um, and I think times are changing and I think it's, uh, whether it's people are being emboldened or just that, um, Maybe I'm projecting. I don't know. I'm curious to know your thoughts. If this is something that you've observed, also, and at all. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite pop bands, actually, the lead singer is um, put out this music, and the focus is like, I bet you didn't know gospel music could sound like this, <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, like trap beats or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like um, I haven't seen it extensively. Um, but I think it's also possibly that um, I just bought a new car effect where like you start seeing your car everywhere because you just got that new car. Yeah. So that, that might be a possibility. I don't know. Well, I mean, I think it's one thing that we might agree on or maybe we might disagree. Um, I think we live in a time where um, the society within which we live in is 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 deaf. I would describe as ag aggressive or opposed towards the Christian worldview. It's not popular, right? Um, and so for me, when I was coming up music, I had a friend. At, at one time, I was thinking about going to, to New York to study at City College, and I had a friend who was already living there. He knew I was a Christian. He knew I grew up in the church, um, and he basically said to me, "I'm going to have to." I mean. I think he said something like, I'm going to have to um, maybe tone down, you know, how I pursue my Christian or something. I can't remember exactly what he says, what he said, but um, I, I think he was way off the mark either way <laughs> with what he was say, what he was trying to tell me. But, but I think the point is um, because um, we all have shared experiences of, um, feeling other because we were pursuing you know a style of music that we love but our you know immediate community and family didn't necessarily um share in that passion or see you know that it was that it was a wholesome thing to pursue you know um i was fortunate that my parents supported me but definitely my you know my church community and some mentors that i had that i had didn't support at all you know they actually tried to you know, Tell me to do something else. Um, so that we definitely live in a time where, if you're a Christian um, and uh, you're not playing in church every Sunday, you're seen as other. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's definitely part of it. And for me, it was challenging to um, navigate those two worlds. 
And I think in late in, in more recent years, I've, I've been able to do that more honestly um, and more transparently. Yeah. yeah. I, I find something very interesting. I'm going to go back to the very beginning when we asked the question, how do you define jazz? And you said, we're not sure how to define it, but the definition that you all came up with was jazz was a music that builds a bridge. It was a music that doesn't stomp over anybody, but it kind of takes the characteristics or the improvis improvisations or the, the, the contributions from people. And instead of stomping, it kind of says, hey, we'll grab that and we'll work with that. And it's like, it's, it's cumulative cumulative and uh, accumulative that's the word i'm looking for <laughs> you know it kind of brings everything and everyone together i find it interesting that jazz is like that and i guess that's why i got surprised when you said that it doesn't seem like there was a connection or it has not been in the past but here's this 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 style of music if i can say that um that wants to bring people and personalities and talents and, and and contributions all together to work together as one that to me is kingdom focus that to me is like kingdom that to me is you know everyone's a part of the body everyone's a part of what this beautiful creation of music is and and i've heard some of your music and i i hear the collaborations i hear the different styles i hear this and i go this is beautiful this is so awesome and and i sit there and go everything is welcome but the gospel <laughs> that's what it sounds like and um and and again that's why it surprises me but going forward i guess i'm wondering is with all that collaboration with all that um, I'm hoping and praying that going forward, that generations to come will not be afraid to bring the gospel in there as well as part of that contribution and everything flows together because jazz is, like you said, Jesse, it's a language and it's a powerful language. It's a language of rhythm. It is a language of harmonics and a language of melody. It's a language that will get through to places and to hearts and to people that nothing else and no one else can get into. And if I can encourage all of you with all of your music, um, please do not feel afraid to, to bring the gospel in the midst of that collaboration because what you produce is beautiful. I mean, I've, I've heard some of your music and I know uh, we, we wanted to talk about some of the new releases that you've had as well. Um, and just, just the fact that you've combined, like there's jazz and there's a little bit like Elizabeth yours was with a little bit of hip hop in there and a little bit of blues and a little bit of, there's a little bit of everything, you know, in there, but you make it work. You make it come together and create this awesome, this awesome creation in music, that's what you do. And I'm sitting there going, wow, that is so God honoring. I love that. I love that you do that. And, and you know, and um, the combination of the, the, if I can call it the Afro beats and the jazz, putting that together. I mean, I love that. I think that's awesome. I honestly think that's awesome. And again, I go back to the definition. It's taking a little bit of everything, putting it together and making it work like a beef stew, <laughs> you know, it's like putting it all together, making it work, making it taste good for those who are coming to get it. And it's like, so add a little extra ingredient, the gospel right in there. It works, <laughs> you know, um, I guess it's, that's just my take on it. I just think jazz is just an awesome style of music. I really do. And I love how you described it. I think that's just awesome. And, and I do want to talk about your new releases, but before I do, is just one other question I can ask, and then we can talk about your releases, which is going forward. Now, you know, there's a, another generation of people that are coming up. And yes, there are there are people that are into rock. They're into, like the younger people I'm thinking of now. Um, they may be into rock. They may be into hip hop and rap and, and, and other styles of music. 
But as I've heard from your music styles, you're able to put all of that in the midst of jazz. What would you say to, I'll say students of jazz uh, or students of music that may be interested in wanting to incorporate the jazz style into their music, whatever their music style is, um, what would you say to them to encourage them um, in pursuing or understanding or even playing jazz or singing jazz? I mean, the first thing I would say is that there's a long history of connections between um, gospel styles and jazz styles. As a matter of fact, jazz was born out of jazz, uh, out of the, um, the, the spirituals, right? Um, and so there's composers like Thomas Dorsey and uh, a bunch of other guys who, you know, who pursued those connections. And um, what, what we hear today as, uh, you know, what's labeled as Black American gospel is very much rooted within jazz. Um, that, that harmonic language, the rhythmic language, um, um, you know, so when you when you hear like, you know, a, a shout beat or, you know, a, a shuffle or something, that's definitely coming from, from that feel. Um, and the, the melodic language is there as well. So there's, you know, long history of those connections. So I would encourage younger musicians to pursue those connections and, and learn about them as much as possible. Um, you know, when you were sharing this, so Cheryl, I thought about a, a mentor of mine who um, was, um, his day job was being a, a graphic designer. He was an award-winning graphic designer, as a matter of fact. And um, he did, you know, he played multiple instruments and did music ministry, you know, at the, at the side. Um, and I remember when I was beginning to, uh, you know, gig on the scene and he cautioned me you know to stay away from doing certain types of gigs kind of like you know what duncan mentioned or like it's to stay away from you know that kind of lifestyle you know that was that was the caution um and i pushed back on, on that you know um and so i would say to younger musicians that as the the gospel is like yeast is like salt to us it's supposed to infiltrate infiltrate in infiltrate every aspect of our lives and so if we are musicians you know it's only um it it, it should influence you know the music and how we how we do how we do music but i think more important to that it should always it should also influence how we build relationships with people um and so i i don't necessarily think it's a fair requirement to to, to um we require everybody you know you know who's a christian uh who believes the gospel to explicitly put that in their music all the time if they are full-time mu musician because that's like you know and the reason why i pushed back on my on, on the prison who was um telling me you know be careful how you do certain things is because you know he had a day job in advertising and he was advertising things that we would probably consider not so wholesome, but it was his day job, right? And so he had to, he did his job, you know? And so I think there's a thin line between uh, what we consider appropriate or inappropriate or whatever. And we have to pursue pursue that, you know, work out our salvation, so to speak, right? As, as we go along. But I don't think it's a requirement for us to overtly uh, put it in our music all the time, even though the gospel should um, be working through, in and through our lives in every single way. Right. Mic drop. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I agree with that, uh, Jesse. It, it, it's not, uh, there are other ways that we can, we can show, uh, uh, as Elizabeth alluded to earlier about the Salvation Army having sort of the two branches the, i mean the the church side but there's also the service side and and i mean well shameless plug my new cd <laughs> <laughs> really has very little to do with the church um it's it's about uh a guy who was my mentor kenny wheeler and it's all of his music but uh you know what do i show in my life that that is that service side of it 
for me, what's you know, I'm at the food bank uh, downtown. We sponsored a family from Ukraine to come to Oshawa, and we set them up in a house. And, and, and these are things that I can do for community, for for the people around me. And, and these are things I'm able to do. I mean, if I could be Kirk Franklin, I would be Kirk Franklin. I just don't have the personality to be Kirk Franklin. Uh, but I can I can love his music as much as I can love Kenny Wheeler's music. I mean, it, it, there are many, many different ways that we can uh, we can show and and the people around us and and for me it's my children they see your action they see your inaction as well and uh so my boys you know they have been to the food bank with me and and ask about things like that and they see it and they know it and and service is an important part of of our lives and so it doesn't have to be in the music but i think it has to be in your life mm. Yeah, I, I, that really resonates, Duncan. I, I think faith is a journey and it's something that is lived and breathed. Um, you know, if, if I were to say it's more important to me to, to put out gospel music or to be a good mom, obviously it's mm -hmm. to be a good mom, you know, and, and like the, the, the things, the things, the ways in which we live out faith are innumerable because it, it's not a separate thing, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. who you are. And, and so it's an evolving thing too. And so I think um, one's musical journey is also should be in, inspired uh, and curious, um, a search, you know, it's something that um, is living and breathing. Um, and there, you know, I've always been a big believer in transparency too, that you might be going through uh, a difficult time or, and it's okay to be, you can, just, there's nothing wrong with that. There are great periods of darkness and any, any person of, you know, any saint has had moments of darkness and moments of doubt. And that's part of the journey. Um, I realize I'm going a little bit off here, but just to say that I think um, to remain honest and, and open is, is key, whether it's in musical exploration or, or one's, you know, spiritual journey. Um, there's, you don't do anyone any service in faking anything. You know? mm -hmm. That's very true. That's true. Uh, authenticity. And I do agree with that. Being authentic with who you are is very, very important. And that would probably come through your music. I love your feedback. Thank you so much for that. Um, what we have, I know we're a little bit over, but we promised we'd talk about your releases. Duncan, you just showed a little bit of your release. I uh, you want to show that up again, your your uh, your album there. <laughs> yeah, it's not out yet, but uh, I don't know oh, how well I can show that. But that's uh, a painting a friend of mine did of uh, the late, great Kenny Wheeler. And uh, okay. so that comes out on Three Pines Records on May 26th, I think. But uh, if you go to DuncanHopkins.com, there may or may not be information there about it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. 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 Yes. And it's entitled and, what? Um, the album? Uh, Who Are You? Okay. Who Are You? Duncan mm -hmm. Hopkins. Awesome. awesome. Um, so this is new releases or anything that's upcoming that's exciting for you? Uh, Jesse? Yes. Actually, I'd like to hear about um, Elizabeth's record first. I know she just released it. Then I can talk about mine. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Elizabeth. Oh, it's big and shiny. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I just released it. It's uh, and I'm calling it a gospel jazz album, so I feel like this is kind of funny um, timing. But yeah, it's. Um, I always wanted to do something that. Um, yeah, it's it's very much scripture inspired, and uh, I wanted to have some kind of proclamation of my faith and worldview um you know and previously my albums are much more like social justice oriented and a little more angsty mm. because uh the world is definitely in in some dark times but um this came out of the pandemic and is is much more joyful in tone because i think i i um i relied on my faith in a in a in a serious way through the pandemic and through many instances of of um yeah whatever there's a lot to say but just uh it's 
it's a more uplifting album. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Awesome. So, that's so that is already now. released. Yeah. It's yeah. It's been released. It came out in February, and uh, I'm just touring that right now um, for the next I don't know year, I guess. And where can people find on. out more information? Uh, yes, www.elizabethshepherd, like sheepherder.com. Excellent. Excellent. We'll, let, we'll get, look, look out for that. I do have that in our in the notes uh, or the description below this video. So definitely check that out, elizabethshepherd.com. And Jesse, do you also have, and Duncan, yours is on your website, duncanhopkins.com, correct? Yeah. Duncan Hopkins. Okay. Awesome. DuncanHopkins.com, ElizabethShepherd.com. And Jesse, do you have any new releases that have recently been released or are coming up? Well, my latest release was almost a year ago now. The last thing I released was a single in, in June last year. It was actually um, a song I wrote for my mother who passed away just about uh seven years ago and so it's you know just kind of talking about the uh it's a song of hope but it's a song about you know about grief as well as well and and filing healing after you know losing a loved one and, and all of that um my first release isn't explicitly a, a a gospel album you know um on the surface i think you know it, it'll it's definitely like an afro-caribbean influence jazz modern jazz album um, but, uh, the song stories, you know, are definitely rooted in my experience, some of my experiences and my, my, my faith, you know, there's a song in there called, um, right to be wrong, um, which features, uh, a, a spoken prelude from Brainerd Blyde and Taylor, who's the director of the Nathaniel Depth Chorale. Um, and, um, yeah, the song pretty much, you know, talks about love and the nature of love. Um, and all of that. So all of all of those messages that I grew up with in church are sort of baked into the music in some way or, or, or the other. Um, but I am also way. looking on was that the way and the way exactly exactly the way is um is a song that I wrote and I I'm I'm happy you brought that up Faith because that was a song that I wrote to help me navigate what it feels like to be a Christian in a postmodern world where it's not trendy to be Christian, you know, um, um, especially for my generation. So um, the, the, the way it's, the title of the song is what I use because the followers of, of Jesus were actually called followers of the way before they were called Christians. Um, and so that's kind of the, the idea of the song. So anyway, I'm, I'm working on a, another large ensemble project um, actually, my first large ensemble project um, that um, it's a suite of music for jazz quintet, string quartet, and chorale um, that I've, I've taken nine different what I call transcendent ideas and I've written um, different sections of the suite, you know, based on those ideas. So things like that, hope. Um, and like I call them virtues, so it's called the Virtues Project: death, hope, forgiveness, uh, joy, thanksgiving, and and so on. So that's um, I'm kind of slowly working on the projects. I'm not out as yet. That is it. Okay. Well, we're gonna look forward to that. When do you uh, anticipate it roughly to come out? Well, what's it's a your hard goal question. To get <laughs> that's a hard question. I, I ask a lot of hard questions, question. don't I? Yeah. When you're in the creative next process. Year? Fingers crossed for next year. <laughs> okay. And where can people find out more about you or get connected in the meantime? Yes. Uh, my website, Jesse Ryan Music, but music is spelled M U Z I K, Jesse Ryan Music.com. Or just like on my socials on online everywhere, I'm Jesse Ryan Sacks, J E S S E R A N S A X. Um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Jesse, Duncan, and Elizabeth, it's an absolute honor to meet all of you and to hear 
uh, excited about your music and to hear your your perspective on jazz and you know, I, I learned a lot tonight. I learned a fair bit about something I, I was not familiar with at all. So thank you so much for sharing. Really, really appreciate it. Faith, I'm so glad you are also here to be here and be my co-host for the, the most <laughs> for this Thanks evening. So much. Thank you so much. If people want to know more <laughs> about my music, they can go to faithamorejazz.com or find me on the socials. Amours, A-M-O-U-R. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, Faith does. Well, I thought that's what I thought you were singing around town. <laughs> anyway, thank I you am. so much, Faith. Are you? It's complicated, yes, yes. okay? It's complicated. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, you know what? Follow Faith's socials. You'll find out where she's singing. And if you're in town, go find her and <laughs> support her. And same with Jesse, Duncan, and Elizabeth, again, thank you all so much for being here. And I thank you for being with us as well. Join us next time when we come back. Uh, next time we come back, it'll be a studio talk and probably talking about music again uh, from the producer's perspective. So we hope that you're able to come back and join us then. Uh, this It's before Easter, so we hope you have a great Easter season. And we'll be back next time here on GMI Hub Online. Bye for now. Now is the time to submit your original Christmas song. The Who Is You. If you're a songwriter and would love to be a part of our Christmas compilation project, then you're in the right place. Where can you submit? GMIHub.ca is the place. Please visit our website at gmihub.ca and click on Family Christmas to find out how you can submit your song today. You could be a part of the GMI Hub Family Christmas Volume 4. GMI Hub is accepting new songs for their 2023 Christmas compilation. To find out how to submit your song, go to www.gmihub.ca today. GMI Hub Family Christmas Volume 4.